We're glad that you're here this morning. I want to introduce to you uh, a couple of important people, uh, friends of mine, uh, but, but more than that, um, they're, they're, they're part of our church and they're part of our community. This is uh, Anthony Garcia. He's a police officer here with uh, Allen Police Department, and this is Bo Simpson, and he's a, a fireman with uh, Plano uh, Fire Department. And so I just wanted to get with them this morning. We're going to just ask them to do a little interview here and ask them some questions. And first of all, just tell us... Tell us about who your family is and, and how long you guys have been a part of uh, FBC Allen. Good morning. Uh, I'm Anthony Garcia. My family, my wife, is Melissa Garcia, and I have two kids, Caden Garcia, eighth grader, and then Peyton Garcia. Uh, she's in third grade. Uh, we've been members of First Baptist Allen for, since 2005. Yeah, my name is Bo Simpson, and I'm married to uh, Julie Simpson, and then we have two daughters as well. We have a 12-year-old uh, and a 9-year-old, Avery and Abby. Um, and we've been going here since 2011. And um, tell us kind of where you're serving right now, your, your current assignment, or what you guys do. Uh, with the Allen Police Department, I've been there for a little over nine years. Uh, the last five years, I've been with the school resource unit. Um, formerly, I, I did four years at Erickson Middle School. Uh, this school year, I was moved over to Curtis Middle School, so that's where I currently assign. And I've been in the fire service for 16 years. Um, I'm a driver, paramedic, drive a ladder truck uh, in Plano, and I'm on the uh, hazmat team as well at that station. So did you guys growing up, when you were little boys, were you thinking, man, I'm going to be a police officer, I'm going to be a fireman? What, what did you guys want to do when you guys were growing up? Uh, I had a friend um, that I grew up with that said that he always wanted to do military first and then get out and work for the police department and I told him that he was crazy because those are dangerous jobs. Uh, he went into law enforcement but it was the opposite side, it was the side behind the bars. <laughs> um, and then I served, I served 11 years in the United States Army and now as a police officer. Awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Mine's not as good, I promise. <laughs> I wanted to be a veterinarian or a trash truck driver, so, uh, so I drive a ladder truck now. <laughs> Bo said his, 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 yeah, his goals were high, trash truck driver. So what do, you, what do you guys love about your job, about being a police officer, being a firefighter? What, what do you love? Uh, you know, the, the, the first thing is, obviously, we all, we're servants. We love helping people. Um, when, you know, when they're having bad days, they call us, and we can maybe make it better. That's, that's cool. And then, of course, in the fire service, you know, I, I live with 10 guys uh, for 24 hours in the station. So as you can imagine... Uh, that could be very miserable or very fun, and for the most part, it's it's fun um, hanging out with 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 all the guys. I forgot the question. What do you love about your job? <laughs> what do you love about your job? Uh, well, again, I, I love to help people. Uh, I, I do believe I'm called to help people. Um, my current assignment, working with kids, uh, I, I, I love being a mentor for them, uh, showing them how, how to live life. Uh, when, you know, when they come to me with issues and things of that nature, uh, let them know that I'm, I'm praying for them. Uh, right now, I, I, I get paid to act like a 13-year-old, and, and I think I do that well. <laughs> Pretty good at it, huh? So um, just in, in your time as, as a firefighter, as a police officer, how, how have you seen God use you uh, in, in your jobs? Uh, with, with my job, um, especially with my current assignment, like I said, any time one of the kids come to me with, with you know, an uh, issue that they're going through, maybe it's a, a family member that's sick, um, you know, just letting, letting them know that I'm there and I'm, I'm praying for them and, and, you know, anything that they need, I'll, I'll help them with. Yeah, and before, um, before I promoted uh, and I rode an ambulance a lot, you know, that was kind of our one-on-one -on -one time that we would have with people. And, and they, would, they would just open up, and they'd tell us where they were struggling. So we, if we wanted to, we could kind of take advantage of that and have conversations with them. And uh, now I think he uses me more in the role of with our, with our new guys, our rookies coming out, um, you know, just being uh, something, someone for them to look up to, having conversations with them. Uh, and then obviously we use him to help us get through all the junk we go through, for sure. Um, we didn't bring them up here, and we should have for this part. But talk to me about your families. What is it like? for them um, to have a, a husband, a dad, who's a, who's a firefighter, who's a police officer, and you guys go do your jobs every day. What's it like for your families? So I said the first hour, I think it's a party at my house when, uh, when I'm not there. Um, so we're, we're gone for 24 hours, um, 
and, and I wouldn't know what it was like to be them, to feel what they feel like, but I do know that, and Anthony talked about this earlier, you know, our wives, you know, they run the houses while we're, while we're gone. We miss holidays, we miss birthdays, we miss stuff. And, uh, and without them, we couldn't do what we love to do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, my wife, she's, she's a very amazing woman. Um, she didn't get home until almost 2 a.m. last night, and she took Caden to Keller for 7-on-7 seven seven football uh, early this morning. So, again, she's amazing. Um, when, when he was born, uh, he was three months old when I went to Iraq, so I missed the whole first year, and she was there uh, raising him. And then when Peyton was born, uh, that's when I was in the, uh, the uh, police academy and, and uh, the FTO training. And so I wasn't around a lot uh, to help out with, with Peyton uh, when she was born. Uh, but she took care of all that. Uh, I'm, I'm away a lot with work. And, and she's, again, she's an amazing woman and, and takes care of everything. You guys do have awesome families uh, in spite of you guys. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so what's, we wanted to do this real quick. What's one myth? that you would like to dispel right now about firefighters and policemen? Not all police officers eat donuts. I, I refuse to eat a donut. All right. And a cat will not die in a tree, I there promise. <laughs> so, so talk a little bit about your training. What, did you, what is some of the training that you guys had to go through in order to do what you guys are doing now? Uh, for, for us, the police academy, you have to go through the police academy first. Uh, it, it changes. When I went through, it was approximately six months, uh, six months long. Um, once you graduate from that, you go into a field training uh, where you ride around with another officer that's, that's training you, uh, and that's four and a half, five months long, um, depending on how, how good or bad you do. Um, but the entire time, you have another police officer uh, that's a veteran there that's telling you that uh, you've done absolutely nothing right for the entire day, uh, and that's the entire time that you're with that guy. Yeah, and our, ours is very similar. We have a fire academy we go to, depending on which one you go to, it's six months or uh, a year for some, and then we go to EMT school and then paramedic school, and then depending on what our specialties are, hazmat school, special rescue, all that fun stuff. And, it, and it's very similar. When we get out in the field, we have um, mentors that we, that we shadow, and they, they take advantage of the time to tell us that we're awful at what we do. I told the first audience, I've, this is like the most safe I've ever felt in this building. I've got a police officer and a firefighter right there. If I had someone here from Taco Bueno, my, my, my day would be perfect. <laughs> It'd be like the perfect stage. So let me ask you this. What, is, what was the most... So far, what's been the most nervous that you've ever been, or, or maybe even, if I use the word, afraid, uh, doing what you've done? Yeah. You know, the, the fire stuff, that's not, that's not scary to me, to us. That's, that's kind of what we love to do. Um, but a lot of our calls we, we run, we run with PD, and we depend on them um, to protect us. You know, they carry guns, we carry clipboards, and so there's not a whole lot we can do with with those clipboards, but there's been the occasion where we've gotten in into a situation where we should have waited on these guys to get there first, and we didn't, and uh, that was the longest few minutes of our lives waiting uh, for the guys that can make the loud noise and, and protect us. So that, that's the scariest I've ever been, some of those situations. Uh, there was a, uh, used to be on Bethany, uh, by the Starbucks on 75, a, a sushi restaurant called Akira, and uh, after a certain period of time at night, they would close down and kind of have a club uh, type environment going on. And uh, I was backing an officer on a traffic stop and when we noticed a, a large crowd outside this bar and, and they were known for fights and stuff of that nature. So we went to go check it out. As soon as we got out of our police cars, um, someone yelled gun and we look into the crowd and there's a guy uh, getting ready to, to point his pistol at us. and. Luckily, it jammed, um, and we can't fire on him because he's in the crowd. But uh, he jumps into this car, and, and uh, Officer uh, Leo, he's, he's Russian, so he, I can't say his last name. Uh, we are now in a foot chase. We're chasing this car down Bethany, and they turn up and to get onto 75. But, uh, yeah, afterwards, I was like, was I really chasing a, a car on foot? Uh, I didn't, didn't gain on it. It wasn't like the movies or anything like that. But... Uh, but yeah, that was a pretty scary situation. So speaking of scary situation, you know, we're talking about messy Christmas, and, and today Chad's talking about, um, you know, going, going towards the mess. And so 
for normal human beings, everything in us, when we see something that's scary, messy, whatever, we, we run the other way or we do everything we can to avoid it. But you guys, you guys go towards it. You know, when there's, when there's something bad going on, everyone's running away, you guys are running at it. So is that, is that, do they train you in that? Is that, you know, is there something kind of loose in your head that makes you think that way? What is it about you guys that you run towards when everyone else is running away? Uh, for us, uh, a lot of it is during the police academy. Um, they're showing us a lot of videos of, of officers that are, were in some situations where they didn't make it out of. Uh, and so they're, they're trying to weed out the, the people that don't have that instinct to, to run into uh, harm's way. Uh, and then as soon as we get into the uh, field training program, uh, our, our officers that are there to mentor the, us, anytime there's a call, where it could be a little sticky. Um, they're always wanting to volunteer. Even if it doesn't get assigned to us, they're like, hey, we're taking this one, um, just to see if we have that instinct to, to go towards harm's way. Um, but, uh, you know, again, like I said, my calling is to help people, so I'm always going to go and, and help, no matter what the situation is. Yeah, and I think the, the other part of that is we are crazy. You have to be a little bit of crazy to do what you, to do what we do, but, but ours is very similar. We're trained. Um, to do what we do. Our situation, the fireside is a little bit different than what these guys have to deal with. You know, we can, we can read stuff and we can um, see what a building's doing or a structure's doing. We kind of tell you what it's going to do, whereas they have to deal with the human aspect of it, which is a little bit different. Um, so, yeah, so crazy and, and, and some studies there, too. So, just why do you do what you do? Uh, again, like I said, uh, I believe it's, it's my calling. I've, for the last 20 years, I've Woke, woken up and put a uniform on to go to go to work. So I believe my, my calling from God is to help people. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, anyone that, that's in this line of work, I mean, if you're not called to do it, then you really don't care about it, and I don't think you'd be very good at it. So, yeah, I think there's just a natural uh, pool for, for all of us that do this. Well, I appreciate you guys. And one of the things that we want to do in our church is we want to continue uh, to pray for guys like this and, and other men and women who are in our church who, uh, who are the first responders who run into the mess when everyone else is running away. So if you, we want to do that right now. We want to pray for you guys. So if you're a first responder or you're the family of a first responder, I'm going to ask if you would just stand just briefly uh, and we're going we're gonna to say a quick prayer over you. But if you're a police officer, firefighter, paramedic, or your family uh, is in that, if you would stand, we're going to pray. Okay, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the men and the women um, who serve us, who serve our communities in, in, a, in a sacrificial way. God, day in and day out, um, they put their lives on the line, Father, so that uh, we as a community can feel safe and be safe. I thank you for them and for their calling. I thank you for their willingness to say yes to that. And Father, I also pray for their families, because I know their families, they, they make a sacrifice too, God, as they um, let their their fathers, God, let their mothers, their, their sons, their daughters, Father, they let them go and, and, and do what it is they do, do what they do, Father. And so I pray for the families, too, and pray for comfort and peace and strength for them because we know, um, God, it is, is as much a sacrifice for them as it is uh, for our first responders. And, God, we thank you for our community and the communities around us, Father, and, for the, again, for the many men and women who serve us sacrificially every day. And, God, we thank you for you. God, for, for Jesus Christ, who came to our mess, Father, came towards us to bring us life, to bring us hope, to bring us peace. And we love you, Father. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now, we do appreciate uh, Anthony and Bo sharing with us. Uh, I, I told them, we've been working on this for a while. I told them earlier this week uh, that uh, I didn't want to feel any pressure doing this, you know, being up in front of everybody and answering these questions with Jimmy. And, but just to remember that if they mess this up, Christmas would be ruined for all of us. So don't, don't let that weigh too heavy. But And so now we can say, Anthony and Bo, save Christmas for all of us. They did a great job. I appreciate them and the work that they do and the way they do it. All right. Messy Christmas. Life is messy and sometimes overwhelmingly so we, we feel it, we experience it, we see it all around us. And we'd like to think that our lives have this uh, orderly, neatly packaged, all wrapped up in a bow kind of, kind of drive. And, 
that that's how it's supposed to be and that we can make that happen. But it's not often that it happens that way because we are messy people living in a messy world. And you look around and you see that sin has caused messes in lives. And sometimes it's our own fault. Uh, the choices that we have made, our own sinful choices that bring about the messy stuff in life. And sometimes it's just because we live in a broken, messy world that those things, we get caught up in the wake of those things. We, we just get bruised and beaten because we live in this kind of broken world. And we struggle. We struggle because we want the day to be perfect. We want, event, we want Christmas to be perfect, everything to be perfect. And it doesn't often work out that way. And now occasionally you'll pull it off. You come out of a day and you'll say, it was a perfect day. Everything about it. Everyone was happy. Everything went the way we planned it. Everything all wrapped up in a bow. But the challenge is the next day you're going you're gonna to wake up and you're going to have to try to do it again. And doing it two days in a row is going to be a big, big hurdle to have to jump. It's hard to live uh, in a broken world. Part of living with contentment in life, the Bible has a lot to say about contentment. Part of living with contentment is understanding that our lives are messy, and they're busy, and they're broken, sometimes just chaotic. And the reason is because, uh, because of our sin and because of sin in the world. Jesus came into that kind of world for that kind of world. Jesus was not afraid of messy things or messy people. He wants to be in it with us and to help us to face whatever we are facing in a day. The truth of the gospel is that God stepped into our messy world, entered it himself so we could identify with him, so we could understand him, so we could be set free by his sacrifice at the cross. We needed some saving. We needed to be set free and one of the things about the Christmas story that's so encouraging to me is that God, though, uh, to this morning I was reading through the Psalms around uh, 110 to about 120, uh, the, those, that set of Psalms. And there's a lot about how glorious God is, how powerful God on his throne, God Almighty, but that God Almighty didn't stay way off out there somewhere to care for us, but he came close. He brought the game to us. He came close to care for us in the middle of this messy world. And he didn't, he didn't love us from a distance. He didn't encourage us, ah, clean yourself up, try harder, live a better life, just give us a lot of moralisms. But instead, he came to do this life with us, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Now, we say God is love. The Bible says, defines God is love. The essence of his character, God is love. But one of the things we know about love, wherever love is expressed, is that love is going to be a messy thing. And Jesus, Jesus not only demonstrated this, but he wants us to follow his example in what love looks like. And what Jesus did is he ran toward messy people and messy lives. Now, we live in a world where people naturally, as we talked about with uh, Anthony and Bo, our natural inclination is to run away from messy things, to, to turn the other way, to, to back away and retreat. But that's not how Jesus did it. It's not how he called his people to do it. See, we're surrounded by people dealing with pain, hurt, difficulty. Life is overwhelming. The struggles can weigh us down. And as, a, as the church... Not this institution, not this building, but as God's people together. God called us to care about messy people and messy circumstances and this messy, broken world and not to do that love for this world at a distance, but to bring it close, to be in the middle of it with other people who are hurting, to help people who are tired and wounded. We're called to be in it with them and to point them to God through the journey. I want to give you an example, a good Jesus example. And what we're talking about throughout these December Sundays is not just that Jesus came, but why he came. And John chapter 5 is a great illustration of Jesus, his example, caring about messy people in a messy world. So John chapter 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then the book of Acts comes after that. 
John chapter 5 has a great story. Here's what it says in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there, had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. And, and Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. Now, this pool of Bethesda, it was a trapezoid-shaped pool. We've, archaeologists have identified it, looked at it, studied it. Estimates vary on the whole thing. I believe maybe one end was around 155 feet wide. The, on, the, on the wide end, about 220 feet wide, somewhere around 315 feet long. It's called the five colonnades because you have the four sides of the the structure, and then down, there was a middle row down the middle of it, so that gave you your five columned uh, areas that then were covered, and apparently uh, fed by springs. There are a lot of springs. They come down from Mount Hermon way up in the north, and they're going to pop up through the sandstone uh, in various places around Israel, and And we believe this is one of them. The spring was coming up, and that's what fed the pool of Bethesda. And so there became this idea that developed that when the water would bubble up, the bubbles come up in the water, that was a sign, a superstition, really, that, oh, my, look at this. An angel has appeared, and the first one into the water is going to get healed. Whoever can get in first, they're going to get a miracle from God, and And so here's this man by the pool, hoping against all hope. The Bible says Jesus came to this pool of hope and hopelessness. And the Bible describes the pool this way. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed, people whose lives were in ruins, people nowhere to turn, nowhere to go, no safety net to catch people in the ancient world. One of the people by the pool was this man, an invalid, probably spent every day there for 38 years. Uh, We don't know how he got there. We assume family, friends, they'd bring him to the pool of Bethesda early in the morning and then leave him there. In the evening, they'd come get him, take him home. Probably a lot of nights he just slept next to that pool. Maybe in the night the waters will be stirred. Maybe I'll have a better chance of healing when the crowds aren't quite so thick. One of the things we learn from that guy is he felt helpless because even if the waters were stirred he couldn't move himself into the water to experience the healing no one was there to help him you can imagine what it would be like all of these people in all of their broken messy lives wrapped around this pool just waiting and watching and then the water would bubble up and there'd be shouts and screams and a scramble as people started climbing toward the water, dragging themselves toward the water. This guy can't do that, he said. And so he just is trampled by the other people trying to get, trying to get into the water, trying to be first, hoping for a miracle. Helpless. Now, We don't know what prevented him from getting into the water. We don't know the nature of all of his malady. We learn from verse 14, though. We didn't read down down that far. We learn from verse 14 from something Jesus says. Sin's played a role in this. We don't know what role that is, but somehow sin has affected him physically. Uh, And here's one of the great messages of the Bible. This is in verse 6. If you're, reading, if you're reading through the Bible, especially if it's a story like this, you read through the Bible and, and you pass over things like this, like this is an inconsequential part of the story, but it's really not. Verse 6 says this, one of my favorite parts of the whole story, and Jesus saw him. 
As simple as that. Jesus saw him. Uh, in the middle of a crowd, Jesus cares about the one. Uh, the one person. And that we see that with Nicodemus. We see it with the woman at the well. We see it with this guy. And I don't want you to know this. We came walking in here today with uh, our own burdens, our own messes. And Jesus hasn't overlooked you today either. And he sees you. And he knows you better than you know yourself. And he knows exactly what you need and how it needs to be delivered. Because that's the nature of the Savior. He hasn't overlooked your condition today. Whatever you need, Jesus sees you today. Now, one of the things to think about in this story is that the temple was not only a few steps from the Pool of Bethesda. So there's masses of people coming to the temple every day to worship. They're going to pass. Some of them pass through this area. Some go near it, but around it. They're all engaged in worship. And Jesus, here's Jesus. He can draw a crowd. He only has to show up in a crowd's gathering at this point in his ministry. But here's what happens. Jesus doesn't look for a crowd. He's willing to let a crowd go to find one person, to find one person with a need, uh, to engage with the individual. Jesus would move away from crowds to find one lost sheep. And just don't think Jesus has lost you in the crowds. As I read this guy's story, I've known people who could identify with this man physically, you know, frustrated, trapped in this body that's broken, trapped in despair. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water's stirred up. While I'm going down, uh, going another steps down before me. But you don't have to be physically handicapped to feel like this man felt. I know a lot of people would echo his complaint about being trapped. Being at a spot where I can't break out, I'm stuck. And despair begins to overwhelm a life. How you feel about every day. How you feel about the future. So through 38 years of this experience, this man had become bitter and resentful. And from some of the things that Jesus says, uh, we, we, we have to wonder. Some people have suggested that maybe he'd, he'd embraced this broken identity. Become comfortable in his misery. Stop trying for more in life. Abandon his God-given Gifts and abilities, things he could still do because he couldn't do what he really wanted to do. He, he was content to be a beggar. It was easier. It wasn't as messy for him to, to just rely on the kindness of strangers. and maybe, maybe that's what he was supposed to do at this point. He could feel sorry for himself, despair, complain, and beg. Whatever the case he had long ago reconciled himself to his condition. I can't help myself. I can't break free. This is, it's his identity now. This is the way I am. I'm the man stranded by the pool of Bethesda, so close to hope and still so far from being helped. He lost the will to get up and get on with life. And, and this is a guy, when you find someone who's really stuck, my experience Stuck people are hard, hard to help, messy to help. You ever known anybody like that, stuck in life? I think about it, I think, well, I've been that person to varying degrees. There have been times in my life where I felt stuck, where something tripped me up and I didn't feel like I could break free of it, where I couldn't get past an obstacle, over some uh, hurdle. Maybe not a physical limitation, Maybe it's a relationship that goes bad. Maybe it's a crisis that arises, but you're stuck. And I don't know how you feel when you read that verse toward the end of verse 6 where Jesus, uh, Jesus asked a question that's really a tough question. And one of the things when I'm reading Bible stories, you read a Bible story, you, you wish you could hear it. Uh, the way Jesus said it. Like the words are there, but what, what was the tone of his voice when he said it? Did he say, do you want to get well? Was it, was it that? 
Was it that hope-filled? Or was it, and based on some of the context, I'm inclined to think it wasn't that way. I think it was more, do you want to get well? Are you satisfied with where you are? Are you comfortable with stuck? Are you just enjoying wallowing in messy? Do you, want, do you even want to get well? Now, we know in the Bible, multiple times, Jesus knew people's thoughts. He knows what's really gone, going on inside of us. And this, <laughs> Jesus asked this question because Jesus knows the possibility exists. This guy doesn't want to get well because he's comfortable in his misery. He knows what today's going to be like. He knows what tomorrow's going to be like. If, if he was actually set free, he doesn't know what that reality might feel like and doesn't know where that road goes. Plenty of people are in such a place. So this guy, he offers up his excuses, the anchors that weigh him down, and Jesus gives this clear command. He says, get up, take up your bed, and walk. His bed was a symbol. It was a, it was a function to it, just a roll-up mat. It was a symbol also of his reality this is a symbol of everything that's wrong with my life. The symbol of what is broken in me. This is the thing that says I'm broken. This is the symbol of my imperfection. This is the thing that says I'm not like other people. This is the thing that says I'm not normal, whatever normal uh, looks like. It's the thing that is like a, a, a name tag that says this is the as is section of the store. And there comes a time when we have to decide, do I really want to get healed? Do I want to grow up? Do I want to do life differently? Do I want to make better choices? When it, do I want to be over this? Do I want to really be complete? There are plenty of applications for us personally. When I read a story like this, I like to, uh, to put myself in the different characters. How do I identify with this character? How do I identify with this character? I feel it. I feel it at a deep level. With this guy, I... I feel it. And I can see myself as this guy stuck, stranded in a broken place, not seeing how life could be any different. Today, I, I, I want to I focus in a different direction. So I'm looking at myself, and I'm looking at my world, my city. And the challenge for us is to step outside what is comfortable and what is convenient, what is safe, what feels clean and simple. Because I live in a messy world. And I think if I'm, we talk about following Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, the only way we've said for the last year, if I'm a follower of Jesus, that means I'm following Jesus. That's a simple enough definition, right? If I'm not following Jesus, I'm not a follower of Jesus. And there are things that go with being a follower of Jesus. And one of those is we share the heart of Jesus for a messy world. And instead of running from it, we run toward it. Now, when I think about these people around the pool of Bethesda, some of them probably would have, as they're making their way to the temple, they would have done what a lot of us do. We see a need, and we do say, well, I'll pray for you, and that's awesome. We're praying for a lot of people in our city these days. Prayer is a powerful thing. God works in prayer, but it really doesn't get my hands dirty and doesn't get into my business so much. Uh, some people, you, you can throw some money in the general direction of a problem, and sometimes, and, and there are times when resources are what are needed. We call for resources and focus those in Christ-honoring ways toward the needs of people. I'll uh, tell you a story. This is not an Allen, Texas story. This is a outside of here during Thanksgiving story. Coming out of a big department store. It was a lady, very well dressed. And because we had parked close to each other, it turned out in the parking lot of this big box store, uh, she was driving a really, really nice new car. And when we were coming out of the store... I already had a Salvation Army kettle sitting outside, out front, someone ringing a bell. Speaking of the times you want to look the other way and pretend you're deaf or 
you're disengaged, so you don't have to give anything. This lady, she, she stopped at the door, and I had to wait for her. She started digging in her purse. I thought, well, good for her. She's, she's felt like I need to do some giving here. She dug in that purse and dug in that purse. And then finally, I thought, maybe she's going to write a check. I don't know. She's, she's getting pretty deep in that purse. And, and then she, she pulled out one shiny quarter, dropped in that kettle. She just solved the problems of the world. But it made her feel a little bit better. At least she did something. That, that may be the first time she's opened up much of her life to, to caring about other people. But sometimes it's just to make us feel better. Like, uh, now I don't have to worry about that anymore. And it doesn't cost us a whole lot of time or a whole lot of energy. And it's clean and crisp and has safe boundaries to it. Now, when I think about Hey, I'll just pray for you. I'll throw some money your direction. That just doesn't seem a lot like Jesus. I mean, you read these Jesus stories, you you start feeling it and you start seeing it that Jesus did things differently than we do things. He seems to always move toward messy things. And you see it. There's a woman caught in adultery and Jesus leans into it. There's, There's a blind man. There's a broken woman of a questionable past and Jesus is leaning into messy messy situations and messy lives and he does that all the time with with the last and the least and the lost and the lonely people of the world Jesus has a heart for messy people one day there was a religious guy and he came up to Jesus and he said I have a question what's the big stuff in the Bible What's the big stuff in script? What's the main thing? What do I need to be sure and not miss? And Jesus said, well, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's all about, it's all about your relationship to God. Second, it's a big deal too. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you remember what the guy said? He said, wishing to justify himself, he said, so about that neighbor thing. That's just people I like, right? That's just people who are easy to love, right? That's just people who are not going to get my hands dirty, right? That, that's what you mean by, by neighbor. And you remember what happened. Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And you know how that story goes. There's this guy. He gets beaten up, robbed, left for dead by the side of the road. And along comes a religious guy. And then comes another religious guy. And both of those guys did what we do when we encounter difficulties. Here's this guy all laid out. And they said, and I'm going to go around because I have so many important things to do. That's going to take time, and that's going to take resources. And I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to give up my comfort. It's going to slow me down. And I, I am going to do good things. I'm going to church. I'm going to, the, I'm going to the temple. I'm a religious person, but I can't get involved in that. And then along comes the Samaritan. The Samaritan stops and... He sacrifices some time. He sacrifices resource. He gets involved. His hands are dirty. He's engaged. It's not going to go away quickly. It's not going to be fixed in an instant. One of the things about Jesus is that Jesus did not come to make messy people into tidy people. And sometimes that's, that's where we draw our line. I want messy people just to get cleaned up. We're going to whitewash them on the outside. And uh, Jesus talked a little about that. that People are all, they're whitewashing tombs. They look good on the outside, but inside they're still full of dead men's bones, Jesus said. We just like to create an appearance that everything's good. Make it look like we have it all together. There's a lot, a lot bigger, bigger work being done. So Jesus, he engages with people who are who are messy, and it's, not, it's going to be more than just stop doing bad things and start doing good things. It's going to take more time than that. It's going to take more energy than that and more heart than that. Jesus met a guy named Matthew. He's a tax collector, and Jesus comes up to him. Sometimes he's called Levi in the Bible, too. He comes up to this guy, and he doesn't say, you know, you really should stop cheating people. You should stop being a betrayer of your countrymen. You should... You should tidy things up. That's not what he said at all. What he said to Matthew was, follow me. And it says, he left everything and he followed him. 
Because for a lot of messy things, it's going to take a lot more than uh, a little adjustment here or there. It's going to take a change in life. And following Jesus always, when you really follow Jesus, things start changing. Things that were important aren't important anymore. And things, things that really matter just get spotlighted in your heart. The Bible says that old Matthew, after he'd begin following Jesus, he, he just had a party, a Matthew party in his home. He invited a lot of his friends. Well, his friends were pretty far from God too. And the religious guys, his Pharisees, some uh, religious uh, scribes, they, they, they're criticizing Jesus. I can't believe he's spending time with messy people. Tax gatherers and sinners. Why in the world would a Jewish rabbi, a guy who's teaching God's truth, why would he spend time, why would he get his hands dirty with messy people? And Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why did Jesus come? This is the whole Christmas story. Why did Jesus come? He came for messy people. He's still coming for messy people. Now, there are people like the, those religious guys. He said, did not come call the righteous. They were self-righteous. They thought they had it all together, and everything's going to be great because everything on the outside looks fine. But on the inside, pretty dark. Jesus came to help people. And until you know you're messy people, you can't really be helped. One of my favorite Christmas passages is not... Not just the Luke 2 and Matthew uh, and their, their accounts, but it comes from John chapter 1, that poetic, sweeping, uh, from eternity past kind of Christmas story that John tells. And he says, in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Jesus is the word of God, the fullest, finest expression of God's nature and who he was and what he was about. Came to dwell among us and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So he came down, John tells us, to be one of us. Because of the mess sin is made of our lives and the mess sin is made of this world. Because there's this broken relationship sin causes between God and man. And God wanted to come to us in a way we could understand it. In a way that would translate to, to simple human beings. And so God became man. Jesus, born of a virgin, entered into this messy world. And he's still entering into messy lives. Engaging with us by love and by grace and his example always one of moving toward the messy when the most natural response in the world is to look the other way or run the other way. Two things. Thing one. This Christmas, know that God loves you. And you, you all came walking in here from all kinds of circumstances. And again, we can make it look good on the outside, but on the inside, there can be some pretty rough things going on in us swirling around our hearts. God loves you, and he sees you in the mess you are in. And, he, and in spite of knowing everything about you, everything about me, he is still leaning into us with love and grace. Here's the second thing. This Christmas, know this, that all around us is this messy, broken world. And God has placed us here, not just to I'm going to sit around now that I've come to know Jesus. I'm going to sit around and wait until time for heaven for me. And then I'm going to check out. But he put us here to engage with this messy world. To make a difference in this messy world. To engage with messy people. And people just need to know. Need to know that God sees them. God loves them. God cares for them. So you think, well, what can I do to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in a messy world? What can I tangibly do in this season when truthfully I think the theme of the season is so much in our culture about selfishness how do I turn away from the selfishness to really care like Jesus cared about the brokenness around me well what can I do and this is a question I'm asking myself I want you to ask what could I do to move toward the messy stuff 
And maybe it's to, to repair a broken relationship. Maybe it's to care about somebody who feels like no one knows or understands or is interested. To, to mend what is broken, care for what is forgotten, love what is lonely. Of all things that ought to characterize us in this season, in following after the example of our Savior, may we be a people that move toward what's messy with the grace and love of a Savior who loved us so much he came to a messy world and to messy lives to make all things new.